Alrighty, now for the Parsha. This week's Parsha is uh, Terumah, and uh, Terumah um, means, uh, some translations will, tra- I think that's the way I, yeah, heave offering, but what is a heave offering? What is, what is that? Uh, it's a, yeah, yeah. Heaver it up on there. Uh, a heave offering. It's a free will offering. It's a uh, it's it's a giving from the heart. We'll we'll read that uh, here in the parsha. So the way I want to approach this this parsha, there's a lot in here. Uh, it's only you know two chapters or so, but there's a there's a lot uh, in here. When we begin, uh, what's interesting is that. Uh, Moshe is given the Ten Commandments, right? And then he's given the, uh, the kind of a, the rest of the covenant. And then God begins to say uh, in, in verse 1, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, and let them take from me a portion, a terumah, okay, an offering, for every man whose heart motivates him shall you take my portion. He is beginning to uh, to um, instruct on the building of the tabernacle, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But what's interesting is that the instructions for building the tabernacle starts here in in Exodus twenty five. Can anybody tell me where the instructions for the tabernacle or the temple end in the Torah? Anybody know? Leviticus 14, I believe it is. 11 or 14, forgive me. In between Exodus 25 and where the temple instructions end in Leviticus, there is no commandment to do anything else but having to deal with the temple, the priesthood, the feasts, the sacrifices. It's all temple. Now, why is that so important? Because we've been talking about how in the, in the ancient world, and of course God, God did it this way, we've been talking about how what does the temple do? What does the, the dwelling place do? It connects heaven to earth, right? It's the, it's the place where, where God dwells among the people, and we're going to see that in this, in this Parsha. So he says, Moshe, receive or take I choose that that word that word there can either mean receive or take uh, some of us come from uh, traditions where they take an offering in every sense of the word take um, you may have and I have it's it's funny uh, but it's not like ha ha funny it's like laugh to keep from crying funny where they take an offering and then they count it right there in front of everyone in front of the in the middle of service and if there's not enough money then the pastor will start calling again and they will pass it again and they will count it and if there's still not enough then the the minister will call people by name from the congregation and say uh brother so and so i know for a fact that you can give a little more than that this week how about another 20 in the offering and it becomes almost like an auction uh can i get 100 here 100 here 20 here 40 here brother so and so sister so and so uh i know that you got a large settlement of your disability the lord needs some of that money uh etc cetera, etc cetera. and that kind of stuff happens in churches every single week and um so i use that to say some of us have been in those situations where they're literally they literally took an offering um that is not what this is this is a receiving every man, verse three, uh, or verse verse two, excuse me, from whose heart motivates him. Out of your motivation, you give. Now, I, I think it's interesting. We've talked about the heart of the matter. We started a series on that that we we are going to finish at some, at some point. Um, Brad is coming to speak on the heart of the matter. The heart is the matter. Th- that's the whole matter of all of this. Uh, we we have to remember that. There, contrary to what we've been taught it was not circumcision of the flesh in the Old Testament and then circumcision of the heart in the New Testament there were always two circumcisions always it was always circumcision of the heart and the flesh from the beginning and so the heart has always been the matter that's the, that's the point of it all and so out of what your heart gives Yeshua said something like wherever a man's treasure is that's where his heart is and so this is having to do with 
when a person desires to give verse 3 it says this is the portion you shall take from them gold silver copper turquoise purple and scarlet wool linen and goat hair now I said I was going to use the the board a good bit today uh, on the the Parsha because I want you to start building your Hebrew vocabulary these are words that we're going to use often and words that you need to know you should be able to know um, pretty pretty quickly and and there's a reason why they're important because they come up over and over and over and over and over again and we're going to see them the other reason is that you may not be able to open up a a Hebrew Bible and read the Hebrew words but when you see a word if you can know how to pronounce it and know what the Hebrew uh, is it gets you thinking in that mindset okay so these three colors are very important because they we see them over and over again okay now in in this particular translation it says uh, to take gold silver copper and turquoise okay that word you may have what do you have in yours blue is that what most people have blue right so this is uh, it becomes a big kind of a thing um, you know it can be a, a matter of debate and contention um, and if there can be a matter of contention in this Torah community it will be a matter of contention if there's one that can be found it will be made uh, a huge deal so um, the word there who knows what the word there is this is one you should know everybody should know this word what is the the biblical word for blue most of the time you see blue Techelet, right? Techelet. Now, this is where the debate can come in. Techelet is um, when people when we see blue, we think, well, just blue. It's just I can kind of make my mind up and decide what color blue I want it to be, and you can do that. Uh, but there's a long-standing uh, history and tradition that uh, this techelet is is this color, and uh, you probably can't see this from the back. Um, but most of you know what Tehelet looks like. Uh, it is um, actually a little bit lighter than this, probably, um, in, in most instances. The word Tehelet is like when we would say navy blue or sky blue or midnight blue. Or Tehelet is a color. It's not the family of blue. It is a blue, a type of blue, a particular hue, a particular color. And uh, most of you will, you know, you know that the, the Tehelet is made from the, uh, the Murex uh, crustacean that only lives in Israel. And uh, it is taken through a process, and that's where you get the Tehelet from. That's also the color that, the, that we were told in Numbers chapter 15 to wear on our uh, tassels. And that is the color when Moshe was up and he saw the throne of sapphire. Okay, that's the same color. Okay, in Revelation, uh, when we see uh, Yohanan uh, having the revelation of the throne, the, the floor of sapphire, right? The ancients would think of the sky as the floor of the throne room of the God. Does that make sense? When they look up from earth and see the sky, that's the, thro- that's the throne room of the God who, who they worshiped. What color is the sky? It's Tehelet. That's the, that's the way we get the, all these connections, okay? So this, this color is really important throughout Scripture. So Tehelet is the blue. Uh, the purple is Argamon. Argamon. And if my history is not mistaken, it probably is, so double check me. But Tehelet and Argamon are made from the same source. They're just treated differently to get different one is, produces a blue and one produces a purple and so uh, argamon is very important and then the last is scarlet and that is tolat sheni and the scarlet tolat sheni is made from uh, is actually made from a worm that only grows or only lives in one type of tree and that one type of tree is only found in the land of Israel and so these are the three uh, dyeing colors or fabric colors that uh, the children of Israel were commanded to bring now you can look at this a couple different ways and I think it's interesting that 
is it that um, is it that these are the colors of the kingdom and God in his divine providence allowed these particular worms and mollusks to live in the land of Israel in order to fulfill this or did he take what Israel had available to them and taught them how to use it to get these colors two different ways you can look at it I think it's interesting to think about either way these are the colors and uh, so Techelet, Argamon and uh, Talat Sheni linen and goat hair linen we're going to find over and over uh, red dyed ram skins tahash skins acacia wood oil for illumination spices for the anointing uh, oil and the aromatic incense uh, show him stones and stones for the settings for the ephod and the breastplate. now how many of you in your translation has something about badgers somewhere in this in this passage anybody has anything one all right have something about badger skins right and then something about either seal or porpoise or sea cow right okay so two interesting um words used there that really those two words modern day hebrew scholars really struggle with what they mean because they they kind of are one-off words that they they have some ideas about what they mean uh one is badger the badger skins the red dyed badger skins and that that phrase the red dyed skins could refer to the color um i i, I would seriously uh struggle with the idea that they, they were catching badgers um, because if you know anything about badgers uh they're not to be really uh, they're not very docile right they're not they're not like they're gonna crawl up in your lap you know and so uh there's a there's a struggle with what exactly this means it could just mean a red leather okay that it, it could mean that and then the other is uh the sea cow thing some it's some is porpoise some is uh sea cow it, there's different ways to try to translate that um and that's a struggle because you're kind of in the middle of the desert where would you find uh sea cows or do i mean god can do whatever he wants so if it's dolphin skins or porpoise skins let it be what it is it's fine um but there's you know there's some some question about what that is so if you see those words in in translation and you're puzzled by them you're not alone all right uh, verse 8 they shall make me a sanctuary what is the the word for sanctuary what is the word for sanctuary mikdash okay mikdash let's just read eight and nine together because there's an interesting wording here they shall make a sanctuary for me so that i may dwell among them like everything that i show you in the form of the tabernacle and the form of its vessels and so shall you do so you've got a sanctuary a mikdash right but is that what god is commanding moses to build right here and now no what is he commanding moses and showing moses how to build the tabernacle what is the word for tabernacle mishkan okay so here in this one or these two verses we have really the commandment for both the temple and the tabernacle we have the mikdash the the uh, the beit hamikdash the the temple uh, the uh, the house of kedusha and then we have the mishkan or the tabernacle and here's the phrase that is that we have to keep in mind now there's a lot of debate over the tabernacle a lot of debate over the temple all, all, there's the, again if there can be uh, controversy or I think as the Brits say controversy if there can be controversy over something in scripture there will be so wherever you fall on the temple tabernacle whatever here is the point the, the whole thing that we have to keep in mind in verse 8 so that I may dwell among them that phrase in Hebrew is "viasu uh, lemigdash." That's the the uh, the, ta the temple. "Viasu lemigdash," "vishikanti." "Shikanti" is an important word. "Betocham." So, this word "shikanti." Uh, let's see. How do I have it spelled here? "Vishikanti." This word is huge. 
this word is that I may dwell. That's what this word is. The, 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 uh, the vav is a, uh, a prefix, and uh, this I here is a suffix, and together it forms a phrase that I may dwell. Now, here's the word that you need to be aware of. Shakan. Shakan. Where else do we see Shakan? Huh? Mishkan. So if this is the dwelling presence, that's what Vishakanti, that I may dwell. Not the presence like uh, like the, the presence of God is something separate from God. It is God Himself dwelling in wh wherever the, the 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 dwelling place is. The dwelling of God, the Mishkan is the dwelling place, the place where he dwells. Right? What other word? I heard it, I think Jill said it. The Shekinah, right? Shekan, the dwelling, the dwelling presence. Okay? Now what's super duper important here is that everything that we're going to read about the tabernacle, about the temple later, about the services, about the offerings, about the priests and the orders and all the, the, the measurements and the, 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 you guys know, if you've, you know, you, we've read through the parshas a couple years now, you guys know that this, it's been kind of exciting here because there was, you know, there was, there was, there was uh, a lot of action and, there, you know, there was this flood and there was this war and blood and, and plagues and then it's kind of exciting reading. And then you guys know that you get to the end of Exodus and the first Leviticus and it's like, grinds to a halt, so to speak, you know, like measurements and, and more measurements and more measurements and more measurements and protocol and requirements and blech. this is the point of all of this what all these details teach us and I love the way Joe Good talks about this what all these details that we're going to read about teach us is it teaches us about the holiness of God the temple the Beit Hamikdash is the house of Kedusha. What is Kedusha? Comes from the word Kodesh, which means holiness, which means separated, right? Set apart. We talk a lot about the presence of God. We desire the presence of God. We want to be in the presence of God. But the presence of God is not, is not something God's dwelling, His Shekinah is not something that just shows up anywhere, anyhow, anyway, because God is holy. And there is a way that we have to approach him, that we have to prepare for him. Because we've made the presence of God something very, very, um, uh, very normal and very familiar. And what does familiarity breed? Contempt. So we, we have to kind of understand that all of these details have to do with setting apart who God is. And, and Moshe is being commanded to build this tabernacle after a pattern that he has been shown on the mountain now, did he see holograph did he see uh, our hologram whatever that word is or did he see blueprints or did did God have a big whiteboard and he was showing him what the we don't know okay but he saw what the the Mishkan was supposed to look like and, and that's what he's building it from okay so these these words are very very important because they're going to show up over and over and over. Okay? So this next part we're going to run through. We're not going to read all of it. But I want to um, just kind of give you, again, some, some kind of vocabulary that's going to show up later. So from verses 10, uh, uh, 10 to about 22-ish uh, is going to talk about the ark. Right? The Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant or the, uh, there's, the there's different phrases. The, the Ark of the, the Covenant of Hashem, of God. And the Ark is the Aron, A-R-O-N. The Aron, not to be confused with Aaron. The Aron, and then in verse 17... It says, and you shall make a cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits in length and, and a cubit and a half in width, 
And you shall make two caravim of gold, hammered uh, to make them from both ends of the cover, and you shall make one carav. And uh, does anybody have anything in there about a mercy seat? Okay. The What verse do you have mercy seat? 17? Okay, a cover is that the mercy seat, right? Okay. Here, here's the something I want you to think about. The word there is uh, kaporet, and I'm not sure how I have it spelled. I want to kind of stay consistent. Is kaporet, K-A-P-P-O-R, let's say E-T, just for transliteration's sake. Kaporet, K-A-P-P-O-R-E-T. I know that's hard to see. Let me do this. I'll put it up here. Y'all got these colors? Hope so. Told you to warm your pencils up. K A P P O R E T. Kaporet. Does anybody recognize this word? Kippur. Kippur? Yeah? As in Yom Kippur? Right? What does the word Kippur mean? Or covering. Covering. God said, you make this, this ark, this ark of the covenant, and you are to put a kaporet, a cover over it. The word mercy and the word seat are not in this text at all. <laughs> okay? So, what does that tell Now, I'm going to... I'm going to backtrack here, but what does that tell us about the fact that there's mercy seat in this translation? It, it's could it be that there's there's a there's an agenda? There's a they're reading back into it and saying, oh well, this is the mercy seat, but that's not what it's called. It's called the kaporet. It's called the covering. Okay. You can get to mercy seat by a kind of a circuitous I used that word earlier did I say that right circuitous oh, whatever um, route by saying that this is where the high priest Kohen Gadol went in once a year right on Yom Kippur he sprinkled the blood on the mercy on the, on the altar on the, the and, and God had mercy and forgave and atoned for the sins of Israel so you can see kind of how you get mercy seat but again that's kind of re reverse engineering a doctrine back onto the, the 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 text and reading it backwards kind of backing into the to the 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 temple from a new new testament or our new covenant theological perspective and i want you to understand that that's not what it's called okay it's called the covering the kaporet yom kippur and i want you to see just as in shikanti vishikanti dwell you have all these different variations i want you to see these these connections between these words because this is how we, we need to start thinking. We need to start thinking linguistically and connecting things linguistically, okay? Um, so next, so that's the ark and the cover. And again, I know there's a lot more in here, but there's a lot in the identity series that I want to get into today. So, um, so then next we have the table of showbread. Is that what your translation says? Most of our translations say showbread. Well, what is showbread? Show me the bread. The, the table of showbread, what is that word? It doesn't, uh, that never made any sense to me. Show what? I don't, I don't understand what showbread means. Well, the, the, uh, the phrase here is um, the table of Lechem hapanim, or hapanim. It's no chet; it's a hey. Lechem hapanim. What is lechem? Bread. What is hap, what is hapanim? Panim, faces. So it's the table of the bread of face of the faces. Well, that kind of changes things a little bit. It can also be the bread of, it's commonly also called the bread of the presence. Um, but we know the word for, for 
presence or dwelling is Shekan. So the the bread of the faces. Um, one thing that this could mean, and again, there there can be different opinions. It's okay, we're all friends. Is how many loaves of bread were to be set on this table every week? It was to be constantly how many? Twelve, right? Twelve loaves of bread that were to be freshly baked every week. Twelve bread for twelve. So could it be the bread of the faces, meaning the, the bread of the tribes? That this, 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 remember, the temple is where heaven and earth connect, where the supernatural and the natural collide. So could this be a, and bread is the bread of what we take communion, communion, when we commune with God. So could this be representative of tying the nation of Israel to the presence of God, the bread? So when Yeshua says, this is my body, take and eat, my, he, it's, it's about connecting. It's about connecting us with the presence. Does that make sense? Or am I losing you? Okay. So, so lechem hapanim, the table um, of the bread of faces. Okay, next we have um, the menorah. This is really fun. Of course, there's the menorah. We could do um, we could do probably a couple weeks on each of these pieces of furniture, um, uh, but we we won't just yet. We'll have Joe back to do that, and then we can all our brains will all melt out of our ears. Um, so the menorah is seven branches. We know that, not to be confused with a Hanukkah, okay, which has eight branches. Uh, one thing that I found really interesting is that when we went to Israel, we you see uh, you see Hanukkah everywhere. You see Hanukkah everywhere. The gift stores and stuff sell menorahs for tourists. But, but Israelis, but Jewish people use Hanukkah. And so we were talking to Hanuk about, you know, what, what was going on there. And he said, no one in Israel lights a menorah. You don't light the menorah because the menorah is Kodesh. It's set apart. Set apart for what? use in the holy temple only so if you take an item out of the holy temple and you use it for everyday use it ceases to be kadosh in that and that's the way that they see it and so the hanukkah is lit in place because of the uh hasmonean tradition uh, maccabean tradition so just again an interesting way to think about it so the menorah has seven branches. Everybody wants to know, what do these seven branches mean? What do they represent? Well, again, there's a lot of layers to this, and they could mean a lot of things. One thing that I find is interesting is that we have seven days of the, of the, the week, creation week, right? The, the Shabbat being the, the greatest, the crowning day. Uh, we have seven years and the, uh, the uh, uh, Shemitah. We have all, all these different sevens that we know about, Right? We also have another seven that is spoken about four times in the book of Revelation. The seven what? Seven spirits. We have the seven seals. We have the seven bowls. We have, yeah, the seven spirits. Uh, Revelation 1-4. You can jot these down if you want. Revelation 1-4. Revelation 3-1. Revelation 4-5. And 5-6. I'll repeat those. 1-4. 3 1, 4 5, and 5 6. I'll talk about the seven spirits of God. Isaiah chapter 11, I'll read verses 1 through 5. Then a shoot will come forth out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch will bear fruit out of his roots. The Ruach of Adonai, the Spirit of God, will rest upon him. If you're counting. Spirit of God, the Spirit of wisdom and insight. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge 
and of the fear of Adonai. What are these seven spirits? Could they be the seven spirits from Isaiah 11? And it says, He will delight in the fear of Adonai. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the poor of the land. He will strike the land with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt around his loins, and faithfulness the belt around his waist. Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. So one layer of the menorah can be seen as the seven spirits of God. Now if you take this, this menorah, what was the purpose of the menorah? What was the function of the menorah? To, to light, to give light. Right? An ancient Israelite, would he have thought seven spirits, seven days? Maybe. But they would have thought, well, it's, it's a big light. And it's a big light. If you've been to Israel, it's massive. It's huge. Or if you've seen pictures, people standing by it, it's, it's very large. Okay? Big light gives a lot of light. If you take the word light and you do a, a word study on light, the word or in Hebrew, light, especially if you stay in Psalm 119 a little bit, you see that the light, the Torah is called light. The word of God is called light. The word of God also gives wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All these words tie in together. All of this is connected. It's all God's not saying something different over here than He's saying over here. It's all connected, and it's all speaking to us about the fear, the wisdom, and the uh, the knowledge of God. Okay. So again, a lot more on the altar. I mean, on the uh, on the uh, menorah. I know those of you in here could probably teach, uh, you know, weeks and weeks on the on the menorah. Uh, let's move on we have next in chapter 26 we have the curtains and again here in the curtains we see the Tehillah the Argamon and the Shani Tolat as well as the linen uh, for the curtains and we have all this connecting uh, language all this connection and then uh, we go to the walls the walls and the covering and then we come to um, we come to the, the place where the, the Mishkan has been basically constructed you have the outer walls you have the covering over the uh, the uh, the Kodesh and the Kodesh Kodeshim, the Holy and the Holy of Holies and then you have in uh, in chapter 26 um, verse 31 ish you have you shall make a partition what else do you have there a what a veil okay The word is parochet. Parochet. If you in the Hebrew, if you rearrange the word, the letters in the word parochet, do you know what word you get? Kaporet. The idea of what was the what was the reason for the kaporet? The reason for the kaporet was to separate between the holy place where the, uh, the priest, where the kohenim served, where there was the menorah, where there was the, uh, the uh, altar of incense we found out later, the table of showbread. That's the three pieces of, of furniture that were in the, uh, the, uh, the kodesh, the holy place. It's the parochet is there to separate from the, between that and where the holy place. Uh, the, the high priest, excuse me, the Kohen Gadol goes in during Yom Kippur where the Shekinah was, okay, where the, the presence, the dwelling presence of God was. So in a way, these two words, parochet and kaporet, are related in that the kaporet is covering the, the, the testimony, the covenant, and the parochet is serving as a separation between the, the people and the presence. So there's a lot of deep connections here. Um, and I think, oh, the altar. We didn't even, we didn't even touch the altar. Um, I'll just give you the word for that, just in case you're interested. The word for altar is mizbeach.
Ms. Bayak, M I Z B E A C H. That is the altar, and I skipped over that one. I'm sorry. That's in chapter 27. Okay? So these are kind of the foundational parts of the Mishkan. I would encourage you to, uh, to go online to the Temple Institute or just to, to uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Google and look up pictures of the Mishkan if you're not familiar. If you're not familiar with what the Mishkan may have looked like, um, there's, there's a thousands of different renderings. Uh, there's people that have done measurements and, and all of these different kinds of things. But, but look at it so that you can connect. You can see, oh, I see the, I see the Tichelet and the Argama. You know, I see where that is. I see where the, the Holy of Holies is and the, the, the Hatzer, the courtyard. And, and all, the, you know, you, you get, start to get a mental, mental image of this because it's all very, very, very important. Okay, and it's, it all sp- carries through uh, even a lot of what uh, Paul's writings, Shaul's writings have to deal with is, is what we call temple language. So what we're doing, if you hear people say, oh, well, that's temple language, or, that's feast language, or, that's whatever. I, I, my, one of my biggest struggles beginning to study this was like, well, how do you learn temple language? How do you learn feast language? Like, how do you know what to look for, right? If, the, if you're reading through Isaiah and you say, well, that's feast language, well, how do you know? Well, that's Yom Kippur language. Well, how in the world do you know what to look for? How do I know what language I'm reading? Well, the way you do it is by you start to build a vocabulary like this, and you, you start to see these, these uh, connections. Um, if, if, I, if I said, was speaking of someone, and I said his elevator doesn't go all the way to the top, you would know what I meant because you all know what an elevator is, right? If, if, uh, you know, if I said he's not the sharpest tool in the shed, you would know what that means, uh, because we have tools and sheds and and you've used dull tools before the only way you know that is by interacting with it by spending time with it okay so that is terumah and